Alright, brethren, if you will, open your Bibles to Genesis 22. There's a directory there in the back. If you would so like to update your information and we'll put it on there, feel free to. Genesis 22, we've been here quite a bit over the last few years, and I hope the Lord will show us something this morning. It's <clears throat> titled that uh, message, A Proven Provision. The Lord's going to be a provision, and He's going to prove it. If I wanted to tickle the ears of mankind and get as many downloads as possible, I'd say this is faith exercises, faith push-ups. <gasps> Here's something to do. Boy, we start perking up, don't we? That's our nature. But the Lord provided Abraham something. That Lord we looked at the first hour, the one that owns everything. This is his earth. We're his fullness that's on it. We're his people, all of mankind, all of everything, your eye teeth to, to your eyeballs, to anything. It don't matter. The Lord owns it, it's His, and He'll do with His own as He sees fit. Now, to believe that, and to believe that God is God, that He lives up to His name, and I'm nothing but a trespasser on His land, and that Christ is the only one that can ascend to glory and stand in His presence, and for me to be in glory, I'm going to have to be in Him. He's going to have to save me, lay down His life for me. I'm going to be His body, He's going to be my head. Be a new creation. When that happens, that's called having saving faith. <laughs> when you believe he, what he said, <laughs> I believe him. And you, he give you a heart to believe, that's saving faith. And I want to be as plain as I can. You hear me? If God gives saving faith, I apply this to myself, as we each should. If he gives saving faith, He's going to prove it. He is going to try that faith. He's going to exercise that faith. And that faith's going to grow. If he's gracious to someone, that grace is going to grow. It's going to happen. If that ain't happened, you ask that he gives you saving faith. And <laughs> he makes it to grow. Here in Genesis 22, 1, it says, And it came to pass after these things. God did tempt. That means prove him. He tested Abraham, not to, for the Lord to find something out. He's doing this to prove to Abraham and to us so we could learn from it. That God did tempt. He proved. He tested Abraham. And he said unto Abraham. He spoke to Abraham. It says, and, and it came to pass after these things. After what things? All the great trials that happened in Abraham's life. That's what we've been going through for months on end now. Isn't it? Several months we've been looking at the book of Genesis. For a couple of months now, I've been looking at Abraham, all the trials that happened in his life. And I've read this, and I've studied this this week, and I just spent all week sitting on it. And I just thought, my old man asked, hasn't he been through enough? Really? Ain't he learned yet? Does he have to go through this? Hasn't, hasn't this faith that God gave him, hasn't it been proven yet? Lord, ain't I done everything? Done everything you told me to do. Kind of. <laughs> We're honest, right? Leave your land, you go to Canaan. Well, we'll go to Tehran. Don't take your family, leave your mommy and daddy. Well, daddy can come along. <laughs> I'll take Lot. Kind of. But I thought, you know, hadn't he been through enough? And then I thought of what the Lord's given us. Bob, the Lord's proved his faith that he's given you over and over. And if you're his, he will continue to prove it. He ain't going to leave you with a day-old experience. He ain't going to give you the experience of yesteryear, of 20 years ago, of some warm fuzzy you had, or one time you happened to stumble across doing what God said you ought to do. He's going to prove it himself to his people anew, fresh, just like Abraham. What's these things that Abraham went through? They, <clears throat> some call this the, the theologians. <laughs> Knuckleheads. You can't study somebody you don't know. They call this the ten trials of Abraham. Well, I counted a little bit more than 10. I thought there's a few honorable mentions in there, but I'll give them to you. First thing, God comes to Abraham 
at 75 years old. Now, he's good and settled. He's got all his ducks in a row. He's got his retirement funds, the wells dug. He's got him a, 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 a cold house down there, spring house, to keep all his vegetables in. He knows where all his gardens are. He's got all of his friends in the community. What happened if God left? Well, we'd just have to find another God, wouldn't we? He's comfortable there, and he's old. He's 75 years old, and God comes to him, and he speaks to him in his comfort, and he says, you leave your family and your friends. You pack up everything you own and leave. If it don't fit in a moving truck, don't take it. Sell it. Leave your children. Leave your businesses. Leave your crops. Leave everything you know. Leave that rock where you and Sarah first met and had your first date and you kissed her. Walk away from it, and you follow God. That's a trial. Do you live that? You forsook everything for the gospel? Then he arrives in the land of Canaan. There's some roundabout ways there, Tehran. And he didn't listen to God. And he said, well, I'm going to cling to daddy just a little bit. God killed your daddy. Let him, let him tinker with it for five years, and he killed him. And he said, you ready now, Abraham? Let's go to Canaan. And he got to Canaan. He was where God put him. He was where God told him to go. And what happened in Canaan? There's a famine. He forsook everything. He showed up where God wanted him, and he just about starved to death. Oh, that gets me weak in the knees. That's a trial. Is it that one? Abraham did. He tells Sarah they go down to Egypt because he put it in his hand. He said, this just makes good sense. I'm going to go where the economy's good. Ain't nobody can, can eat here. I'll go down to Egypt, get me a job down there, keep my family fed. Troubles arose. He had a real pretty wife in the flesh. That's physically what happened. There's no just best spirit, there's spiritual implications. Physically, he had a good-looking wife. And he said, that king's going to take notice of you, and he's going to kill me so he can have you. They're heathens down there. Now, Abraham wasn't lying. They took notice, didn't they? He said, you tell him you're my sister. What a trial that would be. That's not, a, that's not a, just a change of who happens to buy the groceries for that woman. You put yourself in his shoes. This is reality. This is life we're talking about. This ain't a history lesson. That's a trial. Wasn't it? The Lord dealt with it. The Lord spared Sarah, spared Abraham's decision, and he provided, kicked him out, and he left there pretty rich, had a whole lot of cattle, a whole lot of stuff, and a little old handmaid named Hagar with him. She was one of the servants that he took out of Egypt. They get back home. Everything's better. And then that nephew of his, he called him his son, Lot. They separate. They got so much stuff. Real estate's getting hard to come by. And nobody wants to give up any land. And he said, pick what you want to do, Lot. Lot didn't say, I'll sell off everything and stay with you. I want to be where the gospel is. I don't care where that is. That can be on a mountaintop. That can be in a valley. That can be over in the city. That can be out in, out in the county. It don't make a difference. I want to be where God's Christ is preached. <laughs> I want to be where the Messiah is ex exalted. And I want to be with brethren. I can't be by myself. I got to be with somebody else. God designed it that way. You can mock that if you want to. I got to be with them. And Lot looked him in the eye and said, I'll take that good stuff over there. Oh, what a trial. You going to leave the gospel over this? Would you leave your family over that? If somebody could start to up and take off for the gospel. Would you leave your children because of that? Hmm. That's a trial. Then Lot got swept away. And that foolish decision he made, as four kings that whooped five kings, and they took over everything. That's a lot of people. And they snatched Lot up, all the other folks in Sodom, and Abraham had to go fetch him. And he took 318 farmhands, not experienced, seasoned gunfighters, just a bunch of old farmhands, and said, let's go get him. Are you crazy? <laughs> That's a trial from 318 men, I can tell you that right now. It's worth dying for. God's sheep are worth dying for. I'll do whatever it takes. That's a trial, wasn't it? And he had to go ahead and get that blood all over him. Knives are awful slick and hard to hold on to when they're covered in blood. As a trial, he smelled like that. He had to go shower before he could go back to Sarah. He had to go look his wife and I, knowing how many people he killed. It's a trial. The king of Sodom, after all this, Melchizedek come. They got the first church service, the first Lord's table. Well, that hadn't been instituted in the law yet. Well, maybe that eternal 
That law is eternal. Maybe we ought to learn something about that. <laughs> Maybe God's consistent. Maybe we ought to learn something about that. Melchizedek comes, brings him bread and wine. And Abraham says, you take, take what you want. Take a tenth of it. Right there, that's, that, see that tenth over there? That's the best patch of it. That's yours, Melchizedek. Take that with you. Because God done something in his heart. And while that's happening, the king of Sodom comes to him and says, I'm going to make a rich man out of you. You give me them souls, and I'll give you everything. Everything your little heart desires. That's a trial. That's a trial. A blessing is a trial. What, what the world calls a blessing. A great financial windfall is a trial. I ain't never seen nobody leave the gospel over being broke, but I've seen a bunch of them leave it because they was rich. And they want to keep their toys. That's a trial. What was they rich with? What did we see the first hour? It ain't yours, is it? <laughs> Maybe if you was faithful with a little bit, you might be faithful. The Lord will give you more to be faithful with, huh? That's why he tells them the one with the talents, huh? That's a great trial that King of Sodom tried to make him rich after the battle. Abraham and Sarah, they take matters into their own hands. We ain't forgot about Hagar. She'd been around about 10 years with them. And Sarah said, well, the Lord, just he's going to have a people, but it ain't going to be through me. He wasn't telling the whole truth. Maybe we didn't understand it. Take Hagar, go lay with her, and that'll be my son. She claimed Ishmael, didn't she? And immediately when that happened, Hagar was despised in Sarah's eyes. That was your idea to be mad over. <laughs> mad over. You think that was a trial for Sarah? Yeah. You think that was a trial for Abraham? <laughs> you got two mad wives at you. Hagar wasn't a wife, but a stand-in. <laughs> you got two women mad at you. The wisest man that ever lived said it's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than to brawl than with a brawling woman in a wide house. <laughs> he had two of them brawling with him. That's fighting each other. That's a trial. Two of them going at each other. The Lord gives Abraham circumcision as a token. He said, I'm going to circumcise the heart of my people. When I have a child, it's mine, I give him life. He goes, I'm going to go into that heart and I'm going to cut that old dead flesh it's useless out of their heart and then but on the outside you will have the token as a picture to remind you the heart work I'm going to do you're going to cut off your foreskin he was plum grown half of you know that's a trial <laughs> he wasn't eight days old this wasn't out of his memory he didn't know what was going to happen and this just happened to happen to him uh, he was grown plum grown he knew what was going to happen they didn't have lidocaine back then that's what Timothy had to sacrifice for the gospel too, didn't he? After Paul got through preaching that circumcision is not of the flesh, it profiteth a man nothing, and then he meets Timothy and says, Timothy, you're going to go preaching with me. God's going to use you. I can tell. Now come out back. I'm going to circumcise you. I would never do such a thing. Maybe God ain't going to use you. I would never be vaccinated. <laughs> well, if God's going to make you travel and preach, what you never's. As a trial for him. Then he intercedes for Sodom. What a trial that was. Have you ever prayed for someone that despitefully uses you? That takes every occasion they can to stab and throw darts at you. And you say, God save them. You ever prayed for a president you hate. And that you think's the boogeyman. And him and Sasquatch teamed up to gang up against you. What foolishness that is. They don't care about me and you. But have you ever said, Lord save our president. God save the king. Prince Charles is sitting over on the throne today. Prince Charles III, God save him. Let him turn off that green nonsense and his organic vegetables and get away from all that nonsense. Give him a new heart. Make him like Christ. You think it would be a better place to live? Have we done it? That's a trial. Go to a brother for Sodom. Have you prayed for the Sodomites in this county? Have I? The homeless people? That encampment's growing out in this county, isn't it? God save them people. They're hooked on drugs. They're hooked on the, the, the wine of Babylon thinking they're righteous. Lord, give them a new heart. Give me an opportunity to preach the gospel to them. Give you all an opportunity to say, come hear the gospel preached. You hookers and, and you pushers and you peddlers and everything else, come hear the gospel preached. Come hear about a man that told me everything I've ever done. And then he saved me. Do I pray for those? I'm a cold-hearted Man, I tell you, I was texting a friend of mine yesterday, I said, I need more compassion. I need to have a heart like Christ. He come to me. I look down on them people. When somebody uses cuss words or, or prostitutes or porn stars or whatever else in our day, I look down on them people. 
I was worse. Abraham stood up and said, God, would you save 50 out of Sodom? Never did ask for a lot, did he? You know it was on his heart. And he knew not to pray for what he wanted, but for what he needed. That's a trial. Isaac was born. <clears throat> well, ten and a half. I had a point five put in there in my notes. Abimelech comes. He gets scared again. Now Sarah's even older, and he says, tell them you're my sister. He, that, that trial was on repeat. <laughs> he walked into it the first time. You think he'd learned something. And what did this wise? Our father Abraham. This great prophet of God, what did he do? The same dumb thing again. <laughs> that was a trial, wasn't it? Oh, I did this before. What am I thinking? You ever done that? I know better. You ever lived that one? Maybe just maybe it's just me. I don't know. Isaac's born. And the Lord tells him. Because there's somebody mocking God's child. And he said, you get rid of him. It ain't my job to separate the tares and the wheat. You hear me? It ain't my job to separate the goats and the sheep. But I'll tell you what, I'll keep them goats from butting the sheep. <laughs> I'll go stick my knee in between them. They butt me. <laughs> Break it up. But here, he finally had Isaac. He had that promised seed the Lord told him. He said, this is the one that Christ is coming through. And there are going to be a whole people made just like Christ through this one. I promised it. It's impossible with you. I'm doing it. And this is him. Ishmael mocks. <laughs> just like his mommy did. Sarah, just like Sarah did. And the Lord said, cast out the bond woman and Ishmael. That woman that's been with you for 28 years. You think they got along? You think they're friends? His flesh and blood, Ishmael. The picture of works, he said, get rid of them. That's a trial. That's a trial. You ever run one of yours off? Because God told you to. I haven't. That's a trial. He said, you give them a loaf of bread and a jug of water and you send them into the desert. And you know that bread's going to run out and you know that water's going to run out. You're sending them to their death to perish, to burn up. After all these hard, serious, lasting trials, all the heartaches, the Lord had one more for him. Wasn't that enough? It wasn't because the Lord had another one for him. <laughs> that answers my question. He's tested, proved once again. And this is the most difficult trial of all. Here's the twelfth one. Now in our text, the Lord says, That son... Your only son, whom you love, you offer him up to me as a burnt offering. He's mine. Give him to me. Genesis 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abram, Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell of thee. The Lord's going to try to test and to prove the faith of Abraham. The faith that God put in him. If he proved what I call faith, I'm gonna, it's gone. <laughs> Go run for the hills. Wouldn't it? The Lord gave him faith. His faith. The faith of Christ. And he said, now I'm going to show you what the faith of Christ does. I'm going to show you how faithful Christ is to his word. I pray the Lord bring heavy trials on us. Kevin, what are you talking about? If, we, if he shows Christ to us, he might save one or two of us. Wouldn't that be something? Strike on, Lord. Strike on. If the Lord gives true faith, it's a gift. Only he can give. It's the gift of faith. If we really have his faith, he's going to prove it to us. He's going to prove that he gave it to us and it's his. He's going to test it out. He's going to make sure it's put to good use. Do you think he'd... Remember that fig tree cursed? Why? He didn't eat no fruit off of it. He said, I don't have no fruit to curse it. And they said, Peter said, you really did curse that tree. <laughs> you really ain't got no... That thing dried up. If the Lord makes something, he's going to use it. If he gives muscles, you're going to use them. If he gives a heart, it's going to beat. If he makes a sheep, it's going to follow him. <laughs> it's going to do something. It's going to comfort the other ones. Some say this is weird. This is strange. Why would you do such things? Why would you say it's, it's it, say something like that, Kevin? Why would you say, I hope the Lord sends us heavy trials? I mean, it makes it hard on us, teaches us something. Why would I say such things? That's weird. That's weird. No, it ain't. Why is this thing happening to Abraham? Is this weird? The Lord told him to go kill his own son? It's not strange. Peter said, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to you 
as though some strange thing happened unto you. Why did this happen? <laughs> Who do you think did it? The one that owns the land and the fullness thereof, right? God controls everything. He gave that trial. Don't you count it strange. Don't you take it lightly. You thank the Lord for it. I'm just ate up with cancer from my, from my toes to my head. Good. Thank you, Lord. Good. Don't you count it strange. Some strange thing to you, but rejoice in as much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. In that trial, when you see Christ high and lifted up in the trial, you'll go, I got joy now. I forgot. You think Abraham forgot? Of course he did. He's like me and you. <laughs> he had to be showed Christ. Peter says rejoice, and James did too. He said, brethren, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. God's going to grow you and mature you and make you patient, teach you to shut your mouth and wait on him, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, ain't he? Don't discredit trials and consider them strange. Rejoice in them. Be joyful because that means you're children of the true God. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. Be good for us. Hebrews chapter 12. This gives us some comfort and assurance during the trials because we know who sent the trials. Hebrews 12, verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son? Here's a rhetorical question. I mean, this was so absurd. It was written here as, as a sarcastic uh, rhetorical question. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? We don't understand that worldly. You love your children, you make them money. You, don't, you chasten them. For if you endure a chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. I know many believers that are in heavy trials, and they worry and they fret because they're fearful and they're disturbed in the trial. I'm in the trial and I'm shook up in the trial. I mean, I'm disturbed, and I'm disturbed that I'm disturbed about being disturbed. You live that way? You ever had that happen? I'm upset I ain't upset enough. I say you ought to be fearful and pray you are disturbed when you're without the trial. If you've got heavy trials, good. The Lord said he chastens his children. Well, I just ain't never had it that bad. You better pray to God shakes your life up. Gives you some heavy, hard trials. Brings you down to nothing where you ain't got nobody or no thing to cling to but Him. If not, you'll die and go to hell. That's verse. Look at verse 8. But if you be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. If you ain't chastised, if the Lord don't send you strong, heavy trials to make you cry out to Christ, and I mean cry, not say a pretty little prayer that everybody else has memorized, and it's a bunch of religious jargon that comes out of our mouth, like, just like the sin that goes in, it comes right back out. I mean cry. God save! And moan. <laughs> I ain't got no hope but you. That's a good thing. You're son. You're child of God. And if not, you're not son. You see that? That's plain, isn't it? The faith God gives must be tried. If he gives faith, he's got to try it. And I'll give you some reasons for it. First, it's got to be proven to us. Not him, he gave it. He knows what it is. <laughs> Some people quoting scripture to the Lord. He wrote that. He knows what he says. It must be proven to us that it's genuine, that it's true. I need to know that. Do you need to know that? I believe him. Do you want to know if you really believe? I do. Is this something my mommy and daddy did? Or is this something that I believe? Am I following a man or am I following God? I want to know. How do you know that you believe if your faith's never been put to the test? You don't, do you? How can you be sure that you are trusting God if you've never had any difficulties or problems or troubles or trials or pains, woes? Trials reveal how genuine the faith is. That's what God said to Abraham when he offered up Isaac. He said, now it's clear that you love me. 
now I know you love me. Now I know you believe me. Not that he didn't know, but now Abraham knew, and now everybody around knew, and guess what? Several thousand years, you know, and I know Abraham believed God. God saved him. It was a work of God. It was his workmanship, wasn't it? Hebrews 11, 1 says, Faith is the substance of things. For It's the evidence of things not seen. It's the evidence of salvation. That's got to be proven that it's real. Next, our faith needs to be proven so it grows. So it's strengthened. The Lord's been gracious to us. Do you want to grow in grace or are you just fine where you are? Don't matter what you want. He's going to grow you in grace if you're his. <laughs> He's giving me faith. Do you want more faith? I believe him. Do I want to believe him more? Yeah. How are you going to grow? It's going to have to get strengthened. It's going to have to grow and be stronger. Just like our muscles. If we live a sedentary lifestyle and, and we don't move and we just lay down all day, you start losing the muscles. And you can't use them. Next thing you know, you're bedridden. The more that faith is tried and tested, the more you have to depend on the Lord and to look to the Lord and wait upon the Lord. The more those things happen, the more faith you have, the, more, the stronger your faith is. As it's tried, faith is strengthened. And faith must be tried to give us patience. James said, tribulation worketh patience. We learn to wait on the Lord by waiting on the Lord. We learn how to receive comfort and be comforted by being comforted. That's how we learn everything else, isn't it? Mike Smith, how did you learn how to love? God loved you. Ain't that right? How are we going to learn patience? We have to be patient. <laughs> I ain't good at that. Me neither. <laughs> it's going to take some time, isn't it? That's a lifetime of work. Then, once that's done, you have comfort and peace. We learn comfort by being comforted, and that's where we get our comfort. And our comfort comes when we're teeth totally shut up to Him. We have no arm of this flesh to lean on. Not a warm, fuzzy feeling, not a person, not a loved one, not a child, not a spouse, not nobody. You ain't got nobody but Christ. You ain't got no function to do but just hear Him. You ain't got nothing else in the world but Him. Now you got comfort. Right then. Everything's fine. I know the Lord. Well, my car's broke down. That's His car. It ain't my car. <laughs> That's His hunk of iron sitting out in that parking lot. That ain't my hunk of iron. Well, you pay taxes on it. No, I pay taxes to His king with, my, with money He gave me. It's His money. Starts changing you. You start having some comfort. You stop walking around this. Stop. You stop walking around this world like people that don't know God and run around with heads with their chickens cut off. <laughs> Calms you down. And then finally, once we're our faith has been proven to us and it grows and we get comfort, now we're going to help our brethren. Our faith must be proven in trials so we can learn and gain understanding, have patience, be matured, so we can help our brethren. I know one of the a brethren that's going through some extreme physical trials and they're a strong willed person and they have desires and I know somebody else that's about to go through that trial and that one believer is a comfort to the other believer because they say I know what you I know what you feel like here's what's here's what you're going to go through I've lived it this is the thoughts you're going to have but you know be of good courage Lord Lord sent this because they know they've lived it they say it's something you read in the book it's something you live you get that? <laughs> and they could help their brethren. Why? Because sheep are herd animals, ain't they? They need one another. I need you. Did y'all listen to that message I sent to you? That's an outstanding message. That was a good, instructive message. And I needed it. I need you. I need you. Your brethren need you. Need you. This ain't something you just dress up and play church on Wednesdays and Sundays. This is life. This is family, isn't it? We need one another. I know another fellow. He's got three children, and all three of them are professing believers. And two of them's married professing believers, and they have babies. Now, who you want to take advice raising children from? <laughs> you want to get you a self-help book down at Barnes & Noble? You want to find somebody that's got heathens running around and children won't mind? Uh, I want to go listen to what he's got to say, <laughs> don't you? I lean on my brother. I call him and say, hey, what'd you do? Here's what I'm thinking. What do you think? Because you've lived it, and I see the fruit of it. I see the fruit of it. I lean on him. I mean, I have the same results, but I'm going to put down the same fertilizer on them plants that he did. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm going to grow them, them tomatoes in the same spot he grew them, watering them the same amount. 
Paul wrote this, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them that are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves comforted, were comforted. How am I going to comfort my brethren? God's going to have to comfort me first. Where is that going to come from? A pretty heavy trial. Now, do you want to avoid them trials? I don't want to walk into them, but if the Lord gives them, don't, don't throw them away. That's going to be profitable. might be years and years later. That's happened, ain't it? Oh, uh, several times. I go through something like, how, how in the world is this going to be profitable? And then 10 years later, when that wound's all covered up, that scar, it's scarred over, don't hurt no more. I see, you see that scar? Here's what you're going through. Here's what I went through. God's going to comfort you the same way he comforted me because you're his. He's going to prove it to you. And then they won't hear, just like children when you give them advice. They won't listen. And then they'll go out and the Lord's going to prove himself to them. And they'll say, that was right. <laughs> he was right, Lord. Lord, the truth what? God tries Abraham. It's good for him and it's good for the whole body of believers at that time. And it's what few of them there was. And it's good for the whole body of believers, what few of them they are in our time. His trial is good for you and me. Do you know that? It is. Genesis 22, verse 1, back in the text. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, thine only Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him up there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell of thee. And Abraham rose quickly, rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went into the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Christ is all through this. I want to help you with your trials because I hear so many of y'all talking about how much trials you're in and I want to help you and I want to tell you what's going to happen with God and his people, <laughs> what he does. That's all missed if we don't see Christ in it anyway. He's through this. This is him throughout. Take your son, your only son that you love. He said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That's his beloved son, his firstborn. That's Christ, isn't it? You pack him up, take him to a mountain. Take him up on Golgotha's hill. You're going to kill him. You take the fire with you that destroys all the sin. You take the knife to slay him. And he's going to carry the wood on him up that hill. You see that? And on the third day, God told Abraham this. He said, that son you love, that's a trial, buddy. I mean a trial. That son you love, take him up that hill and go kill him. And for three days, God didn't talk to him. You think he prayed? The heavens were shut up. Why? Because Christ had to be forsaken. That's what it pictures. Had plenty of time to soak in Abraham, didn't he? Lord knows what he's doing. He knows how to treat his children. He knows how to train them up. And on a third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place far off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go up yonder and worship. What's worship? Sacrifice. You think Abraham gave up some thoughts them three days? You think he gave up some of him? Those three days he sacrificed it. Needed God. Needed, needed to see Christ again. And why did he do that? He sacrificed telling his wife where he was going. He believed God. All the doubts and fears he had going through his head. And, well, what is my family going to think? Well, when we was heathens, we was throwing babies off the of mountains. They're going to see me taking my child up a mountain and go throw him off the mountain. They're going to think I'm killing him. They're going to think I'm uh, going back to organized religion. And, and Sarah, well, I think the Lord's going to raise him. He said so. He believed God. But he's going to come back. He's going to have some scars on him where I cut him. And he's going to have burns all over his body because I burn him. What am I going to tell her? Her beautiful sons just marred and scarred. And, I mean, Lord gave him life. What am I going to do? And he went through all these things in his head. You know how I know that? Because he's a man just like me. But what overrode every bit of that? He believed God. And it's going to be proven. And I bet every step he said, I can't believe I'm walking this direction. Why am I doing this? Lord, let there be another way. 
and then he was made to brought them three days to say, not my will, Lord, but thy will. Is that right? It's a good trial. Good trial. Not to say, well, the Lord's will be done. To mean it. <laughs> not to say, I believe God, but to believe Him. Not believe in Him or on Him. Believe Him. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon his on Isaac his son and he took a fire in his hand and that knife he sharpened that morning and they went both of them together. But what he told them servants and we're going to come again to you. You see at the end of verse 5 I'm going to go up I'm going to kill this boy and both of us are coming back down. How could he say that? He believed God didn't he? He believed God. Well it don't look like he believed God. It looks like he believes God. And they went up together, verse 7, And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? He was trained upright. He had heard about Adam and Eve, and that Adam didn't have a covering, and that God killed a lamb, robed him. Blood was shed, he had a covering. He had a righteousness on him. And, he, and he'd been taught about Cain and Abel. Cain worked hard. I mean sweat and was diligent. And he brought the fruit of the land. And God said, I don't respect your offering. Abel came and said, I'm here on the blood of another. I'm trespassing on your land. I ain't got no business being here. You provided yourself a lamb. Here it is. That's the only thing I bring. And he said, I like that sacrifice. That's good. <laughs> That's accepted. The other one ain't. Isaac had heard these things. He was trained up. And Abraham gives five words to his son that we ought to give to our sons and daughters and mean it. Not this here is a Sunday school class we happen to memorize. Mean it. And I pray God send us a trial so we can really say it. Not pretend. Gives him five words that we ought to do it. You and I also. If the Lord will make us get a hold of these words, we'll have the foundation to grow on on everything else. To base all of our other trials from. <laughs> everything. No matter what the trial is, big or small. Here it is. Verse 8, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. First off, he will provide a lamb to stand in the place of Isaac. I'm going to kill you, son. He'll raise you. You might be the lamb. I don't know what the Lord's going to do. He said you're going to live. And he told me to sacrifice and both's going to happen today. I'm going to sacrifice you and you're going to live. I don't know how it's going to play out. But if the Lord wants the lamb, whether it's you or one caught in a thicket or me or whatever else, he's going to provide it. Physically, he's going to be an offering for that. But this here stands for us. This atonement for sin. There must be the shedding of blood. Without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission to sin. God's going to have to provide that. Our blood ain't worth nothing. It ain't as valuable as bulls and goats. At least them birds and fowls out there, they cry, the ravens cry whenever they're hungry to the Lord. Do we? <laughs> Knowing he has to give it. Second, what the Lord's going to provide, this blood is going to be for himself. God will provide Christ, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And he's providing. He's providing Christ, our representative, in a body that was prepared for him. But he's also for himself. That sin atonement is for us. It was for Abraham. It was physically there for Isaac. And, and, and that's for us. He shed his, willingly laid down his life for his sheep. He's the good shepherd. He died for us. But he died for himself. You get that? He died for the Father, didn't he? He laid down his life for the Father, honoring his will. Our king came to this world and lived perfect. He died in perfection, and he was risen, and it all honors the Father. He remained just. <laughs> As holy law withstands. Upheld the whole way. Because Christ came and honored the Father. Why? One, he deserves it. Two, you have to. <laughs> I have to. You have to. He did it for us. What's required? If anything's required, it better be in him. The trial, the suffering, the pain that Christ endured by being forsaken of the Father, it was all for his chosen elect, but it declared the just and holy God, and it honored him through the end. 
the blameless Messiah, the God-man. He worshipped in purity, without vanity. It was not deceit in his mouth ever. He solely looked to the Father, trust in Him, and having the Father's will as His focus from cradle to grave. That's who God provided. Do you want to provide a different sacrifice? Do you want to bring something in your hand to God other than that? I never missed a Sunday school. I never missed a day of church. Do you want to take that to God? <laughs> I don't recommend it. I, I've made myself holy. I'm so just sanctified now. I'm right for the picky. Mm-mm. Don't. Christ was tested and tried as we are, just as Abraham was, yet without sin. He knows what we've been through. He knows what Abraham went through. He knows whatever you're going to go through. Go to him. He's handled it, yet without sin. Have you been tested? Has the Lord sent you a trial? He says, my God will provide all your need. Right now? God will provide. Son, God's going to provide. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. He doesn't say he's going to provide all your wants and, and your prayer requests and these lists and these the committees, people gang up on God. Knock that stuff off. Quit it. Ask him for your need. Well, I got more than one need. No, you got one need. <laughs> he's the one thing needful. Lord, give us our daily bread. Our Lord taught us to pray like that. Does he mean we didn't have enough sense to ask? Well, my stomach's growling. Can I have bread? No, oh, give us Christ today. Allow us to see him. Allow us to see his provision today. Not you want, she needs. I know a whole lot of people that want the gospel. I know a few of them that need it. That's like that deer that pants in the wilderness after water because they have to have it. What if you have to have the gospel? Do you have to have a substitute? Do you have to have a a mediator, or you're going to get one. He will provide. Son, God will provide. Isn't that it? So whenever we have a trial come, it's hard. Hard trials come. Don't discredit them. I'm telling me, don't discredit them. Look to the Lord. Ask Him to reveal Christ to you. See Him high and lifted up. See His provision in all things in my my faith, the growth, the payment for sin, the breath that I breathe, uh, my physical health, whatever. <laughs> Nothing money paid a light bill. Uh, I pray I can see him and know that he will provide and be taught. I know he's going to provide. He always has. You know what's going to happen tomorrow? I'm a sinner. I'm going to forget. And I'm going to wake up and go, oh, I got a letter from the gas company saying it's going to double this fall. What are we going to do? <laughs> Oh, he keep me hungry for him. There's this country's maybe on a on the cusp of a, a physical downfall to where things get real hard. And there might be some physical famine in this country. I don't know what the Lord's doing. And it looks like we might be on a cusp of a spiritual famine that we always have been in. Does the need change? And does his provision change? It don't, does it? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's faithful, isn't he? Amen. All right. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the trials that you send us. Lord, increase our faith. Give us patience to look to your son in the way that you see fit, Lord. And if that's through heavy, hard trials, it's right. And be gracious to us, Lord. Be merciful to us. You have been merciful to us. Give us grace to be thankful for your wisdom, not our own. For your righteousness, not our own. For Christ's redemption, not our own choices. Forgive us for what we are. Lord, be with your people everywhere. You promised you will be. We see these things, Lord. And give us experience so we can comfort those just beginning in trials and beginning in heartache. Give us the wisdom to point one another to Christ. It's in his name that we ask it. Amen.